Hi and welcome back to my Physics Online Video Lecture Supplement Series. In today's video I wanted to continue discussing rotational dynamics and specifically I wanted to talk about the topic of angular momentum. So far there has been a variety of rotational phenomena that we've looked at. Uh, basically the angular position, velocity, and acceleration terms that we find in rotational kinematics and we've looked at those along with their analogs in translational kinematics. We've also looked at force and its rotational analog torque. We've looked at mass, which is a measurement of the inertia of an object and its rotational analog, which is moment of inertia. And finally, we have looked at translational kinetic energy and its rotational analog, which is rotational kinetic energy. We've looked at Newton's laws. We've looked at a variety of conservation laws, etc., in both translational and rotational form. The only thing that we have done so far, therefore, in translational motion, which we haven't found some sort of analog for in rotational motion, is momentum. And it turns out that momentum also has a rotational counterpart, which is sometimes called angular momentum. And along with this counterpart, there is also an associated conservation law, which is the conservation of angular momentum. And so those are the things that I want to look at today. Linear momentum has a rotational analog which is found in angular momentum. We sometimes represent that with the vector L. And the definition for angular momentum L is that it is the radial position crossed with the momentum. So it is a cross product which means that it forms a vector which is perpendicular to both of the two vectors that were used to make that cross product. The two vectors in question are the radial vector. This is a vector which begins at the origin, where the origin is basically the axis of rotation. And it points from that origin point to the location of the mass, which is moving about that origin. And then P, of course, is the momentum vector, is given by the mass times the velocity. So if you wanted to find the magnitude of the angular momentum, you take this distance between the axis of rotation and the object which is rotating about that axis or orbiting about that axis, and you multiply that distance times the linear momentum of the object, which would be the mass of the object times the speed at which the object is traveling. Then you multiply that by the sine of the angle which is between that radial vector and that momentum vector. Unit-wise, linear momentum is given by P equals mv. And so if you were to multiply m times v times r, you would get kilograms times meters per second times meters, which is kilogram meters per second squared. This also can be given by the unit joule seconds. So a joule, of course, is a kilogram meter squared per second squared. And so you notice that we're missing a squared on this per second. And so hence it is joule times seconds. And the angular momentum itself is actually a conserved quantity. This means that if you don't have any external forces or torques acting upon the system, then you will have the same angular momentum at one point in time as you will the next. Typically, actually, it is the torque which is going to change the angular momentum. And so basically, those two statements can be summarized by these two equations. First of all, if there is no net torque on the system, then the initial angular momentum of the system and the final angular momentum of the system are equal. On the other hand, if you do have a net torque on the system, then the net torque should be the change in angular momentum per unit time. What this means is that so long as no torque is actually placed upon this spinning disk, then the spinning disk will retain the same angular momentum regardless of what else happens. If you were to drop some object onto the disk so that the disk's mass and hence its inertia is increased, the moment of inertia increases, the result would be that although the angular momentum is conserved, the disk would slow a little bit. 
So it slows just enough to keep this angular momentum the same. Let's look at a couple examples of that. So our first example is how much net torque do you need to change an object's angular momentum from one value, 55 joules per seconds, to another, 75 joule per second. Uh, excuse me, 75 joule seconds in a time of two seconds. Since the net torque is given by the change in angular momentum per unit time, we have that the net torque needs to be the final minus the initial angular momentum divided by the amount of time that this should take. So this amount of time is of course 2.0 seconds and so what you get is 20 joule dot second divided by 2.0 seconds and so the net torque is equal to 10 and remember that the unit joule is equivalent to the unit newton meter which is the correct unit for torque. Second question, suppose that you have a planet which is orbiting a distant star and the planet has some mass say 1 times 10 to the 24 kilograms and it's orbiting the star at a distance of 2 times 10 to the 10 meters at a speed of 875 meters per second. What's the angular momentum of this planet going to be? This is of course asking for what the magnitude of the angular momentum will be and so we can use basically r times p to get the magnitude. If we were to draw this same thing as a, a diagram from above, basically the planet is orbiting around the star, maybe in this elliptical orbit like this. So at some moment, this right here is the radius, and right here, the momentum is going to be mass times speed. So L in this case should be 2.00 times 10 to the 10 meters times the mass, which is 1.00 times 10 to the 24 kilograms times the speed, which is 875 meters per second. So 2 times 1 times 875 times 10 to the 34 means that the magnitude of the angular momentum is about 1.75 times 10 to the 37 joule seconds. So that is the angular momentum of that planet. Hey, last but not least, suppose that this planet is on an elliptical orbit and so at some point it gets a little closer and at some point it maybe gets a little farther from the star. We don't know whether this is the farthest it's going to get or not. But let's say that it gets a little closer. We want to know how fast will the planet be moving when it gets closer. Now before we might have tried to answer this using Kepler's laws, but Today we're going to do it using conservation of momentum. Conservation of momentum says that L initial is equal to L final. So what that means is that the radius times the momentum, which is the mass times the speed for initial, should be equal to the radius times the mass times the speed for final. Now the planet's mass is not changing. But this does mean that the final speed should be the initial radius over the final radius times the initial speed. So that is going to be one point, uh, excuse me, it's going to be 2.00 times 10 to the 10 meters because that's how far away it was in the previous part, divided by 1.50 times 10 to the 10 meters times the speed that it had previously, which is 875 meters per second. So what this gives us is 1,166.6 repeating meters per second. So since we have only three significant figures to work with, that would be 1,170 
meters per second approximately. So as the planet gets a little bit closer to the star, it's going to tend to speed up, and then as it gets farther away, it's going to tend to slow down. These results, incidentally, are consistent with both the results that we had from Kepler's laws and therefore with Newton's laws, and they are consistent with the conservation of energy because as the planet gets closer to the star, its gravitational potential energy is going to decrease, and therefore the uh, kinetic energy must increase in order to sort of make up the difference in energy so that the energy is conserved. There's another way of calculating the magnitude of the angular momentum. Since the magnitude of the angular momentum is the linear momentum times the radial distance times the sine of the angle between the two, then we can rewrite this linear momentum as m times v and v is going to be r times omega because v is effectively going to be equivalent to like a tangential speed if you will and in fact if you were to combine the sine of theta with this v you would in fact get the tangential component of v and so that becomes basically r squared m times sine of theta omega is really r squared m omega and so that is equivalent, therefore, because m times r squared is equal to the moment of inertia for a point mass. Therefore, the total angular momentum should be the moment of inertia times the angular speed. And this actually works even if you don't have a point mass. It's just you end up having sort of like a sum because you'd have a bunch of different radii. So you did basically add or integrate over all the radii and you could get the same result for an extended object. So angular momentum being conserved also means that if you change an object's moment of inertia, then you're going to have to change the object's angular velocity to make up for it. So for example, you see this little figure skater here and she's spinning relatively slowly with her arms extended. And as she brings her arms into her center, she's going to decrease her moment of inertia because more of the mass is going to be concentrated near the axis of rotation. And the result is that her rate of spinning has to increase in order for the angular momentum to be conserved. And so she'll speed up as she does that. So this is conservation of momentum with torques you have the initial angular momentum plus the net torque should be equal to the final angular momentum. So if there is no net torque, then when you increase the moment of inertia, you must decrease the angular speed and vice versa. The only way to avoid doing that is to apply some net torque. So for example, if you were to increase your moment of inertia while also applying a net torque, you might maintain a constant angular speed. Let's look at a short example of this. It's a kind of a wordy example, but it really is a relatively short, simple one. Here is a disk which is spinning about with some initial rotational speed, 25 radians per second. And the disk has a moment of inertia of 25 kilogram meters squared. Then a, a block is taken and dropped onto the disk. The block has a total mass of 2 kilograms, and it has a center of mass moment of inertia of 5 kilogram meters squared. We need both of those pieces of information, as it turns out. So the question is, assuming that the block lands so that its center of mass is actually right on the edge of the disk, meaning it lands a little farther out than is shown in this picture, and assuming that it sticks to the disk, so it moves along with the disk. What is the new rotational speed of the disk and block system? Well, we can write that the final angular momentum and the initial angular momentum should be equal. So what this means is that the moment of inertia of the block plus the moment of inertia of the disk should be equal, uh, excuse me, times the final rotational speed. Let's just start this guy over. Huh? 
So to solve this problem, we're going to use conservation of angular momentum. That means that the final and the initial angular momenta should be the same. Now, the angular momentum, of course, is the moment of inertia times the rotational speed. So we're given basically the initial rotational speed. We're given the initial moment of inertia. This would be, we'll call it I sub D for disk. We need to figure out what the moment of inertia for the block is. Basically, what the rule here is, is that I for the block plus I for the disk times the final angular speed should be the moment of inertia for just the disk times the initial angular speed. And so if we want the final angular speed, we can figure out what was the disk's moment of inertia divided by the block plus the disk moment of inertia, and then that is going to be times the initial angular uh, speed. All right, so for the block, I block would be basically M block R block squared, where this is R block, plus whatever the center of mass uh, moment of inertia is, which would be this right here. So this right here is the moment of inertia center of mass. This term right here, we're given two kilograms and we're given that it is 12 centimeters from the center. So this term right here is 0 0.12 meters squared times 2.00 kilograms. And so that is going to be 0 0.0288 kilogram meters squared for that term. This one right here, of course, is 5.00 kilogram meters squared. So the total for the block is going to be 5.0288 kilogram meters squared. All right, so this means basically that the final angular speed should therefore be the moment of inertia for the disk, which was 25.0 kilogram meters squared, divided by the moment of inertia for the block, so 5.0288 kilogram meters squared plus the, the disks moment of inertia which is 25.0 kilogram meters squared and then that is going to be times the initial angular speed which was 25.0 radians per second so we can basically go ahead and plug those guys into our calculator to get 20 5 times 25 divided by 25 plus 5.0288. And so that gives us a final angular speed of 20.8 radians per second. So the final angular speed, we have three significant figures to work with, 20.8 radians per second. So you notice that as you drop masses onto this block, you're going to tend to slow it down, slow down its rate of angular rotation. And conversely, if you had a way of lifting these blocks off without accidentally applying a torque from friction or what have you, then you would increase the rate at which this disk is spinning. All right, let's look at a slightly longer version of that example, uh, something that's a little more complex, but is basically the same example with more parts. So you have a man sitting in a spinning chair, and he's holding a couple of weights, one in each hand, and he starts by holding both at his chest. And so what we want to know is, what happens if the man basically extends his arm and moves the two weights out away from himself. Now we expect him to, to slow down when that happens, but we want to see exactly how much he slows down by. Okay, so let's solve these in order. For number one, we want to know what the total moment of inertia for the system is. 
So the man is, has a certain moment of inertia, and then there's two masses. So let's figure out what the moment of inertia for the two masses are. We're going to treat them basically like they are both point masses. Um, this is because we're not given any other information in this problem. And so the moment of inertia for each individual mass is going to be the mass times this distance from axis of rotation squared. So that should be 8.00 kilograms times the distance, which is 15 centimeters. So 0 0.15 meters quantity squared. So each individual mass is going to have a total moment of inertia of uh, 0.15 squared is 0.0225. So that times 8 is going to give us 0 0.18. So that would be 0 0.18 kilogram meters squared. And there's two of those, so the I total initial is going to be 0 0.900 kilogram meters squared plus 2 times 0 0.18 kilogram meters squared. So this is for the man, these are for the weights. So if you add all of these together, you get that the initial total moment of inertia should be about 1.26 kilogram meters squared. All right, so the next question is, if that is so, then what is the total angular momentum? So that's a magnitude question. L should be I total initial times whatever the rotational speed is initially. So that is 1.26 kilogram meters squared times 2 by 2 pi to get from revolutions per second to radians per second, because this right here was in rev per second, 2.00 revolutions per second. So this gives us a total 15.8 joule seconds. So our initial momentum will just record as 15.8 joule dot seconds. All right, third question. If the man extends his arms to the side so that the weights are 70 centimeters from the axis of rotation, we need to figure out uh, what the total moment of inertia of the system is. So the man has extended his arms, and so he actually is going to increase his own moment of inertia. He maybe also is extending his legs to do this. So he's initially sort of sitting in the, the chair like normal, and then he sticks his arms and legs out, and that moves a lot of mass away from the center out towards the edges of the system. And so now I man and I mass are going to be different. I mass should be um, the weights are 70 centimeters from the axis of rotation. So this is now mr squared. We could call this final, whereas this one was initial. So this is the final, and this was the initial. This would be 8.00 kilograms times 0 0.700 uh, meters quantity squared. So what that gives that the each mass now has a moment of inertia of 3.92 kilogram meters squared. And so the total for the final, I total final, should be 2.00 kilograms for the man. So I man final plus 2I mass final. Okay, so that is going to be 2.00 kilogram meters squared plus 2 times 3.92 kilogram 
meters squared. So that gives us a total moment of inertia of 9.84 uh, kilogram meters squared. So last but not least, so this is the total final moment of inertia. Last but not least, what is the final angular speed? Well, the initial angular speed and the final angular speed are equal. And so recalling that moment of inertia times angular speed gives you the uh, total angular momentum, we can write something like this. Uh, omega final should be the moment of inertia initial over the moment of inertia final times the moment, uh, excuse me, times the angular speed initial. So that is going to be 1.26 divided by 9.84 times 2 revolutions per second. So what that gives us is um, a total of 0.25 revolutions per second. Or if we want it in radians, that is equivalent to 1.61 uh, radians per second. So that's what the final angular speed of this guy is going to be when he shifts his arms out. So that's a pretty dramatic change. From 2 to 0.25 is almost a factor of 8 difference in the guy's angular speed. All right. To summarize what I've said so far, you can apply linear momentum by applying a force to it, and under the same principle, if you want to change the angular momentum, then you apply a net torque. So if you add all the torques together and get zero, then the change in angular momentum is zero. If you add all the torques together and do not get zero, if there is a net torque, in other words, it should be the change in angular momentum, which is going to be the moment of inertia times the uh, change in angular frequency, or excuse me, angular speed per unit time. So angular speed per unit time is the same thing as angular acceleration, hence the net torque should be I times alpha, which is what we had before. So the, the next question is, what happens if you have a radial force acting on an object, a purely radial force? Well, what that basically does is it's going to change the object's moment of inertia, assuming that it's not a merely a centripetal force. So if it either exceeds or does not match the centripetal force, then this net force, this net radial force, is basically going to allow the object to slip farther away or move closer in. And so what that does is change the moment of inertia, and the end result is that the angular speed will change in order to compensate for this effect, but the angular momentum remains constant. So this brings me to my next topic of discussion in this set of notes, which is collisions between extended bodies. So, so far we basically dealt with collisions between things that we can treat as point masses. We've, this has taken us quite a ways, actually. A ball colliding with another ball, two cars crashing, a bullet embedding itself in a target, etc. And we basically have had uh, two conditions that may or may not be upheld. The first one is energy conservation. This is the one that may or may not be upheld because the collision may or may not be elastic. If there's no energy transfer across boundaries, that basically means that energy will be conserved within the system. Although, again, the mechanical energy may or may not be conserved and basically what you need is a coefficient of restitution in order to determine the energy for the system. In these collisions, linear momentum will be conserved. So this is true as long as there is no net external force acting on the system. When we extend this to, well, extended bodies, then 
what's going to happen is that we still can satisfy these two conditions as appropriate for this one and generally for this one if there's no net external force. But we add a third condition, which is that the uh, angular momentum is going to be conserved provided that there's no net external torque on the system. So let's see a quick example of that. Well, maybe a not so quick example. In any case, let's say that we have a stick which has been nailed down to a table and everything here is frictionless and you have a disc which is moving and it hits the end of the stick and it sticks to the stick. So the question is, let's describe this motion. What's the angular velocity going to be? What's the angular momentum going to be? What's going to happen to the kinetic energy, etc.? All right, well, the fundamental thing that we can use here is conservation of angular momentum. I'm not even really going to try to do conservation of linear momentum here because this being an extended object means that you'd have to find an instantaneous linear momentum for each point along this object. And I'm not, I don't really want to do that for this particular example. Basically, the disk is going to stick to this, means that the two are going to be moving together afterwards. So they will have the same angular speed together. So conservation of momentum, of angular momentum, says that the final and initial angular momenta must be equal. And what we're going to do is we're going to use that the linear momentum in both cases will be i times omega and so we basically can use the initial and final moments of inertia times the initial and final angular speeds so the initial conditions this is stationary so in a sense, we're basically doing like a sum of for both of these. In the initial condition, this one does not contribute because it is not moving. So only this one has any kind of uh, I or omega. Well, basically, the moment of inertia for the disk is going to be the mass of the disk times this distance r for the disk squared. And the moment of inertia has, is now this. The angular speed, omega disk initial, is basically going to be whatever the speed of the disk is right before this impact happens, divided by the distance from the axes of rotation. So we'll call that our disk. And so basically what we have here is that in the initial condition we have a mass of the disk times distance between pivot point and disk times speed of the disk divided by the distance between disk and pivot point. So we can cancel out one of those. Alright, so that's the initial condition. The final condition is that we have uh, the same for the disk. L final is going to be mass of disk times distance for disk times the final speed of the disk, V final disk, which we can also write as mass of disk times the uh, radius squared for the disk times the omega for the disk. Because V is equal to omega times radius. So this is for the disk. And to that we are adding for the stick. And the stick has a mass of 2 kilograms and a length of 1.25 meters. Uh, 
And basically what we need to know is something about the moment of inertia for that stick. And if we treat the stick as being a simple rod, then and it's nailed on the end, then the moment of inertia for a rod is going to be one third of the mass times the length of the rod, which actually happens to be that uh, length from axis of rotation to where the disc is hitting the rod uh, squared. And then that needs to be times the final angular speed. So in other words, our final angular momentum is going to be given by this plus this, and so that we can write as easily as being uh, one third of the mass of the rod plus whatever the mass of the disc is times the radius squared for the disc, which incidentally is just marked as R in this diagram. So this is the radius for the disc uh, times the final angular speed. So now we want to know what's this final angular speed going to be, and for that matter, what's the uh, final angular momentum. Basically, we can start plugging numbers in. So the final angular momentum and the initial angular momentum are going to be equal, so it's probably easier to just calculate it that way. So L final equals L initial is going to equal the mass of the disk, which is 0 0.040 kilograms times the radius, meaning the length of the rod, so 1.25 meters, and then that's times the speed of the disk, which was 25 meters per second. So that means that the final and initial angular momentum of this system is about uh, 1.25 uh, joule seconds, one and a quarter joule seconds. Okay, the other question was what is the final angular speed? Well, that's going to be that number we just found divided by this. So one third of the mass of the stick plus whatever the mass of the disc is times this length of the stick squared. So the final angular speed therefore is 1.25 joule seconds divided by the mass of the stick was 2 kilograms, so we'd have 2.00 kilograms over 3 plus 0 0.040 kilograms times this length of the stick squared, 1.25 meters squared. So that gives us a final angular speed of about 1.42 uh, radians per second. So that brings us to the final question, which is, what is the kinetic energy of the pair after the collision? So in order to get the final kinetic energy, basically we would say that the kinetic energy is going to be primarily rotational kinetic energy, and so that is one-half times the moment of inertia times the angular speed squared. Since this is final, we use this the final angular speed. Okay, so now we need to calculate what this moment of inertia is, and that was given by this formula. So the moment of inertia is one-third times the 2.00 kilograms ton, uh, uh, excuse me, plus another 0 0.040 kilograms and all of that is times 1.25 meters squared.
Okay, so this means that the moment of inertia is about 1.1 1 .1, um, kilogram meters squared. So that means that the kinetic energy at the end is going to be given by one half of that times the uh, final speed, final angular speed squared, which is 1.415 uh, radians per second squared. So this final kinetic energy, uh, kinetic energy rotational final is going to be given by also about 1.1 1 .1, uh, joules. So that should be less than what the initial kinetic energy is because the two have stuck together. That means it is not an elastic collision. And indeed we find that the initial kinetic energy, if we wanted to, to do comparison's sake, it would be one half times the mass of the disk times the initial speed of the disk squared. So that would be a half times this number times this number squared. We'd find that the initial kinetic energy is about 12.5 joules. So that means that quite a bit of energy is going to be lost in this collision. There are a few possible follow-up questions to this. I'm not going to really spend the time in this particular video to answer them. But what would happen, for example, if the disc hits the end of the stick and instead of sticking to the stick, the disc comes to a stop and the stick swivels around? Uh, of course, the disc is stopped before the stick swivels around and hits it. Um, of course, if it's a frictionless system and this comes to a stop and then this swivels around and hits this, this could then come to a stop and this di the, uh, the disc could continue on with the same speed that it initially had. But what would happen before that happened as far as the angular speed and the angular momentum of the system were concerned if this comes to a stop? Well, you'd approach it in a very similar manner to what I did before of figuring out what the initial angular momentum is and then figuring out what the final would need to be in order for the angular momentum to be conserved. Uh, what happens if this hits the center or the other end of the stick instead? Those are some more interesting questions as it turns out because this gets us into the idea of a percussion point. So uh, in this previous example, there's different points along the stick at which this disc may hit it. And it's possible, depending upon where the disc hits the stick, to actually increase the amount of linear momentum after the collision as compared to what we had before the collision. And so basically, if, if you want linear momentum to be conserved, then, and this happens, then you have to have an external force acting on the stick. Well, there is such a thing here because there's a nail between, uh, that's nailing the end of the stick, and that can apply a force to the stick. So that's where the extra linear momentum might come from. But now we have to consider what direction that force is going to be applied in. Um, if initially you have a stick pushing backward on the nail, then the nail is going to push forward, which is in the direction of the motion, on the stick. Uh, this is what happens basically if you have the uh, disc hitting one particular end of the, the stick. On the other hand, uh, you could look at what happens if the disc hits elsewhere on the stick. And the answer is that this net external force from the nail may shift directions depending upon where the disc hits the stick. Uh, 
and there's a special point at which the disc can hit the stick, which is called the percussion point. And this applies not only, by the way, to discs and sticks, but to whatever you want. A tennis racket swinging on a ball, as in this figure. Uh, two swords, which are uh, hitting each other while fencing. A baseball bat hitting a baseball. A golf club hitting a golf ball, etc. It turns out that it's actually pretty difficult in theory to find where this is. But the special thing that happens when you hit the percussion point is that you need zero net force from the nail or whatever else you have supporting the end of the object in order to conserve all of our momenta, uh, specifically the linear momentum. So angular momentum has to be conserved, linear momentum has to be conserved, and for the special point, the percussion point, that results on zero force being applied to the object which is securing the other end. So if you hit on the percussion point uh, on this racket with this ball while holding it, you will feel the least amount of force that your hand is having to apply to the racket. You'll feel the least amount of jerk on the racket, if you will, or jerk against your hand from the racket. So there is obviously some application to this to sports and to sports medicine, if you will. Uh, by hitting it in this point, you would presumably minimize the risk of straining or otherwise injuring your hand, your arm, etc. So I wanted to revisit the topics of torque and angular momentum. And I, I'm doing this in a new context, which is that I want to start talking here about uh, just what happens when you apply a force or a torque to an object which has an initial momentum. So the right-hand rule is used to determine the direction of the angular momentum, just like it's used to determine the direction of the uh, angular speed, excuse me, the angular velocity. And in fact, the angular velocity and the angular momentum must have the same direction. And the way the right-hand rule works has been explained in uh, a previous lecture. Basically, uh, if you want to figure out which direction the angular uh, velocity is in, you can take your fingers and curl them in the same direction as the thing is spinning. And whichever direction your thumb points in, that's the direction of both the angular velocity and the angular momentum. So if you have a counterclockwise spin, then the thumb of your right hand points upwards. If it is clockwise, the thumb of your right hand will point downwards. Um, if you wanted to change the angular momentum, recall that the way you do it is you apply a net torque. And so the change in angular momentum is given by a net torque times the amount of time over which that torque has been applied. But recall that torque is given by the cross product between the radius and the force. That means that torque has to be perpendicular to the direction of the applied force. So if you're going to apply a net torque, then the direction in which your object changes its motion by tilting. Let's say you have a something like this bicycle wheel and it is spinning in some direction and that gives a angular momentum. Maybe it is in this case spinning uh, as per this arrow. That means that the angular momentum is going to be pointing to this lady's left or to your right if you're viewing this screen the way that I am. So what happens is, is that maybe she says, okay, I want to tilt the wheel so it's upright, meaning so that this handle and this handle are vertical with respect to each other. So the natural inclination to do that would be to push downward on this handle and pull upward on this handle. So what happens when that occurs? Well, we have to change the angular momentum when, when this happens. 
And that angular momentum needs to change in the same direction as the torque which is applied. Notice that the torque is pointing towards her because it has to be perpendicular to the radial distance. That's the direction that these are initially in. It has to be perpendicular to the force. So radial direction is to her left, force is down. That means that torque needs to be towards her. And similarly with these two, you also find that the torque is towards her. That means that the angular momentum change must be in the direction towards her, not in this direction that makes the wheel actually flip the way that she's trying to make it flip by applying these forces. What that means is that this will tend to resist a smooth transition from uh, pulling, uh, pushing down here, pulling up here, and getting it to just rotate smoothly. Instead, it will sort of twist a little bit in a direction that appears perpendicular to the direction in which she would think she's actually tilting it to. This principle also explains how tops and uroscopes work. The top here is spinning. And what happens is, because it's spinning, it has angular speed. It therefore has angular velocity, and it has some angular momentum. And that vector is labeled here. The vector is labeled from the center of mass. It's pointing out through the top of the top. And it is pointing basically in the uh, direction along which it happens to be spinning. So it's spinning about this axis here. Now gravity is going to work on this top. It works at the center of mass and gravity of course is straight down. If this top were not spinning and if it were balanced exactly on the end, it could be in an unstable equilibrium. If you touch it just very slightly, it tips away from that unstable equilibrium point, thunk, it falls over. But you notice that while it's spinning, it tends not to just fall over on its side. Instead, it spins and it sort of rolls around this point so that this uh, top of the top would describe a little circle around this z-axis. The z-axis is the straight up and down axis so that gravity is working in the negative z-direction. Z-axis is has the origin at the point where the top is touching the ground. So why is it that the top does that? Well, your axis of rotation is from this point on the ground to the center of mass for the top. And your force is gravity, straight downward like so. And so this angle between the two is given by this angle phi. And basically, you're going to get a torque that acts on this, which is r cross f. This vector cross this vector it has to be perpendicular to both of these vectors. So the torque actually is sort of in this direction. It's uh, I guess it's more or less not in the x direction, not in the y direction, but it's in the xy plane. It's, it is not necessarily in the z direction. In fact, it is not in the z direction at all because gravity is in the negative z direction. So this has to be perpendicular to that straight down direction. And this torque is going to be parallel to the change in momentum direction. And so you have an initial momentum, you have a change in momentum, your final momentum should be the initial plus the change in momentum. So now you get a new momentum vector that's pointing along this way. Basically just means that this top has rotated and it has also sort of revolved slightly. And what's happening is the torque basically causes what's called precession. The top sort of spins around so that it its top describes a circle like this and the whole thing maybe describes a sort of cone where the base of the cone is where the, the center of the top is uh, touching the ground and then the cone sort of radiates outward through, uh, let's say, the center of mass of the top or through the uh, point at which the, the end of the angular momentum is. And so the change in angular momentum is not 
towards the ground. Hence, the top doesn't fall over, but rather sort of spins round and round and round in this precession. To do an example, let's consider this rotating gyroscope as shown in this figure here. And it has some given mass. It's got a given moment of inertia about its axis of rotation, uh, the axle specifically. And it's going to have some initial angular speed. The axle is going to have some given length from support point, if you will, to where the disc is. And what we want to know is what's the initial angular momentum going to be, what's the torque going to be, and what's the rate of precession going to be. All right, I'm going to go ahead and set up some axes just to start us off. So axes number one will be the x-axis. That's going to be the direction in which the angular momentum and hence also the angular velocity are pointing or if you want to think of it as angular velocity and hence angular momentum then that's fine. Uh, this is the initial angular momentum direction. I'm going to make the z-axis be the vertical direction. So gravity points in the negative z direction and therefore this right here has to be the y-axis by the right hand rule. So what's the initial angular momentum going to be? Well, the initial angular momentum needs to be whatever the uh, moment of inertia is times whatever the uh, angular speed is for the magnitude. And if I want to get the whole vector, then it's going to be the angular velocity times the moment of inertia. Well, moment of inertia is given here. That's the moment of inertia about the axle on which it's spinning. Angular velocity is given here. So this right here as a vector is going to be, well notice that this is in the x direction, so it'll be uh, 0 0.0750 kilogram meters squared times 150 radians per second, comma, 0, comma, 0, because there's no angular momentum in the y or z directions. So what this ends up giving us is a total of 0.075 times 150, which is 11.25 uh, joule seconds. So the initial angular momentum is 11.25 joule seconds, comma, zero, comma, zero. And you can express that in whatever form you prefer. This is just simple Cartesian coordinate form. All right, now let's figure out what the net torque is. And to do that, we look at the center of mass. We notice that the force of gravity is acting in the straight down direction. So this would be m times g. And so that is 0, 0, 2.5 uh, kilograms times g. So this is, since it's down, it's negative 24.5 newtons. All right, and the r vector is right here. It points from this point that's the base of support times this length, and so the r vector is in the x direction is 0 0.150 meters comma 0 comma 0. Cross product means we need something that's perpendicular to both of these and the torque is always given by r cross f. So what that's going to basically mean is uh, it cannot be in the x direction because this term is in the x direction only. It cannot be in the z direction because the force is entirely in the z direction. And so it needs to be this number times this number, and it's going to be in the y direction. And by the right hand rule, it's specifically going to be in the positive y direction. So we go 24.5 times the 0.15 that we had for the. Uh, radial axis and what you end up getting is 3.675 newton meters. So this gives us the 
net torque that acts on the system. Now, the, the next question that could have been asked is maybe what is the change in the uh, angular momentum over some given time? The problem is, is that because this, I'm intending this video to be watched by both physics with calculus and general physics that's algebra based, that problem is not really solvable for the latter class because as the angular momentum changes, these, this direction, this direction, both end up changing and therefore R ends up changing. And so as this guy rotates, R might end up somewhere else in the XY plane. And gravity still ends up downward, but the basically means that at every moment this thing shifts that means that the torque is changing direction at each moment. That means that really in order to solve this, we might want to use uh, calculus, basically. The next question actually is, what's the rate of precession for this system? And to do that, you actually can use a fairly simple equation. It looks like this. Omega, which is the rate of precession, is equal to the mass of this thing times g times this radial distance divided by the moment of inertia times omega. So what this is saying is that the uh, speed of precession or the rate of precession should be 2.5 kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared times 0. 150 meters divided by 0 0.0750 kilogram meters squared times 150 radians per second. This looks like a truly calculator worthy problem here. So let's stick all that stuff into our calculator. 2.5 times 9.8 times 0.15 divided by 0 0.075 divided by 150. And that gives us 0.32666 repeating. So the rate of precession should be about 0 0.327 radians per second. So that's the rate at which this, this uh, precession is happening. So that's it for today. That's it for uh, rotational dynamics. I hope that you enjoyed this set of lectures, and I hope that you found this video helpful. And, well... Thanks for watching, and I will say that those of you who are in my course might want to look at some of the slides in this set of notes because there are some links in them to some additional supplemental videos, not all of which are my own videos, but some of which might be kind of interesting for you to watch. Uh, but in any case, thank you for watching this one.